what I do with my financial system is I set a target each year. This is how much money I'm gonna save and invest. And those numbers are aggressive. And, th and then remember, whenever I make any unexpected income, let's say I did a speaking gig or something. Yeah, yeah I might get myself some, I might go out to dinner, but the rest I'm just putting straight in investments. Wow. Okay, so that money grows aggressively. And I, I also wanna remind everybody, especially the entrepreneurs watching, I know you have a lot of entrepreneurs, you wouldn't believe how many entrepreneur friends I know who have a good business and they don't invest at all. And that's a huge mistake. Simple, low cost target date funds is a great way to go. They, they get a little too smart for their own good. They say, I could just put that money in my business. And I always say, look, I'm glad you have a business that's throwing off tons of cash. That's awesome. Most businesses don't last yeah, 80 years. Yeah. So be smart. Give yourself a small plan B. Put 5K a month, 10K a month, whatever's appropriate for your level of success. And hey, maybe your business does really well, that's awesome. But maybe one day something goes wrong. Always wanna be prepared. You never wanna have your back against the wall. So once you have a certain amount of capital, you do have a few opportunities that you probably didn't have before. Um, everybody has this idea that you know the rich have all these crazy tax breaks and captive insurance and this and that. And I've looked into all that stuff. Here's the truth, the truth is, very conservative. I'm like, dude, only in this country could I have been this successful. I'm yeah. happy to pay my taxes. It means that I had the opportunity to create something great. And if I pay an extra 5,000 or 30,000, it doesn't change my life at all. And I want to be able to give back to the society that enabled me to do what I do. I've always found that the people especially entrepreneurs who talk about tax breaks all the time are typically the most unsuccessful ones. Wow. Two reasons. One, why are you talking about tax breaks instead of growing your business? Yeah. And two, it's a very scarcity-driven mindset. Ooh, I only have this much that I have to protect when really you can just grow the pie and your taxes are simply a proportion. Just make more. Just make more. Now, yes, you do want to optimize and take advantage of all uh, legal tax breaks. So as you earn more, you do have more opportunities. You have uh, not only your 401k, you have all kinds of advanced uh, IRA options, mm -hmm. you have HSAs, you have a variety of things. But at a certain point, if you're making enough, you're gonna max all of those. But then the next step is to simply create a taxable account. It's just a typical non-retirement account, just at Vanguard or where I use Vanguard, whatever you want and you just continue to invest. So that's one, and that's gonna keep making you money over the long term. It's just you're not gonna get those tax breaks from a 401k, an IRA, et cetera. The other thing is, as you accumulate more and more assets, you're gonna start to notice a lot of different people are gonna come with opportunities. I, dude, I get text messages from these crazies. They're like, as you start to accumulate a lot, you're gonna wanna do, have a little fun with your money when it comes to investing. Mm -hmm. So some people wanna do crypto. You took a little bit, you had some fun. Five to 10%, once you've got all your other stuff automated, you've got your index funds, lockdown, HSA, your different accounts. Um, I don't have any problem. I think you should take five to 10% and you should have some fun with it. For me, I did angel investing. So if you wanna do crypto, if you wanna invest in somebody's bar, you wanna do angel investing if you're qualified, et cetera, be my guest. But don't jump to that first. Get all your stuff automated. And at a certain point, the compounding is so insane you will start to actually earn more from your investments than you will from your income, even if you're making 500K a year. How would you react if you lost $75,000 in 11 days? You'd be freaked out, which is exactly the opposite of what you should do. That, so everyone says this common thing and they just roll their eyes. Oh, buy low, sell high. But in reality, they actually buy high and sell low. Mm -hmm. So you know what I did? I did nothing. I logged in, I felt no emotion. It wasn't like my life is over. It was like watching someone offer me concrete to eat. Like I felt nothing. I'm like, nah, it's fine, whatever. I just closed the window. The key there is every month, my system is automatically investing. It's called dollar cost averaging. It's just automatically investing. And you should set the same thing up too. You shouldn't be paying attention manually. You shouldn't be sending a check. It no. just works automatically. And so I knew this month, the market is down. And if you think about any other thing you buy, if the price of toothpaste goes down, you're happy. If the price of milk goes down, you're happy. The only time we get weird is when the price of the market goes down and then we're like, oh, let me pull all my money out. Bad move. The price went down. If you're young and you have a long time before you need the money, you're getting, you should get excited. So I just said, great, it went down, fine, doesn't bother me. And I just closed the window. And a few days later, my system will just 
purchase it again. So if it's up, it's down, it doesn't matter in the short term. But over the long term, we know that the market tends to return about seven to eight percent. Mm. But it can go up, it can go down, and yeah. so you do not want to be paying attention in the short term. Have you planned out, so you know that 10 years from now you're going to buy a house. Do you have a 20% down payment set aside? Mm. I do, and I have no plans to buy a house anytime soon, but I have 20% set aside for a house. Without for what I know is coming, even though I have no interest in it today. What about the first year of your kid's life? Do you have that set aside? What about X, Y, Z? Are you taking care of your parents when they get older? Mm. Um, one thing that, that I really love to do is um, talk about relationships. So I love to invite my family once a year for a big, big vacation where we can all stay in a house and there's a, you know, like a chef and all this stuff and we can all be there and the kids can be playing. Now, if you've done all that stuff, you got your six month emergency fund, you've got your investments automated on autopilot, and you still have money left over. You're in an awesome position, and now you can do a couple of things. One, if you wanna keep growing that money, you can simply invest it in a non-retirement taxable account, and that money will grow like crazy. If you're putting in 10, 20K a month, that money will turn into massive amounts. And you can, if you guys don't believe me, just go uh, search for compound interest calculator. Bankrate has a really good one, and plug in 20K a month for 10 years, and that's it, just stop and watch what happens. It, it becomes like an, a tsunami. You cannot stop it. So that's one. The other thing is if you wanna invest in a little bit of fun stuff, if you're like, hey, I wanna take 10% of this and invest in like this crazy investment, my buddy's starting a thing, go ahead. Just be prepared to write it off. Maybe it works, maybe not. And then from there, you should also remember mm. a third thing, and nobody really talks about this. Maybe it's time to increase your quality of life. Mm. Maybe instead of uh, staying in the middle back seat, right. it's time to upgrade to the exit row. Maybe it's time to really think about your money dial and say, hey, I always claim that wellness is important and yet I'm still eating like the same old thing I used to eat 10 years ago. Maybe it's time to upgrade what I eat and, and where I work out and all that kind of stuff, my, my gear. You can do that. Yeah. You've made it. You already won the basic game. So right. now you get to benefit from it. Hey, so a lot of people are gonna hate me after I say this. I know you guys have all been told uh, since you were like two years old, real estate's the best investment ever. And it turns out that's not really true. If you're buying a house and living in it, most people in America are told that the American life, the American dream is graduate from college, get married, buy a house, white picket fence, 2.5 kids, and you made it. And I think we all just have to look at people who are a little bit older than us to realize that might not be our American dream. We might want to travel more. We might want to work remotely. I mean, here we are in the middle of a weekday, yeah. chit-chatting and sharing it with millions of people. This is our dream. So I want to challenge people to really question what you've been taught. That's number one. Number two, most people who buy a house and live in it think that it is the best investment. They don't understand that when you spend money on a house, You've incurred tons of phantom costs. You have taxes, you have maintenance, you have all kinds of things that you don't count. And if you actually factor all those numbers in, real estate often, in fact, many times, is not a great investment at all. It's a place to live, and you have these phrases like, you're throwing money away on rent. It's not true. Uh, your landlord's making a profit, otherwise they wouldn't do it. That's not true. Your landlord can't charge you whatever they want. They can only charge you what the market, market. will bear. Now, on the other hand, if you are a real estate investor, and you're yes. disciplined, that's a different story and that can be effective. But mom and pop who, who are thinking that they bought their house in 1970 for $200,000 and now it's worth 600,000, they think they made 400,000, actually not. If they had taken that money and put it in the market, they would probably have much, much more. Yeah, so, and, and listen, if you, go, I will buy a house one day, okay? So I don't want anyone to think that I'm telling you never to buy a house. Yeah. If you wanna rent for the rest of your life, you absolutely can. Many people in New York, San Francisco, and other high cost of living LA, cities, yeah. they rent. No, there's no shame in that. I rent by choice. I could buy a place tomorrow, cash, and I choose to rent. I couldn't get for the amount I'm paying where I live, if I were mm -hmm. to buy a place in the same building or area, so much. it would be four times more expensive. So that's the first. Second is maintenance. I'm gonna give you an example. Uh, I woke up one day and the doorman was knocking on my door. It's like 8.30 in the morning on a Saturday. He's like, sir, sir, do you mind if we come in and take a look at something? I said, okay. And we go into the living room and there's a pool of water just sitting there. In your apartment? Yeah, it had dripped down three levels. So I was like, oh my God. They're like, sir, go back to sleep. We'll take care of it. That day they came, they repaired the floors, 
not just of mine, the ceilings oh. for the next two levels down, that's probably likely to have costed them, let's just say 50K, maybe 100K, because it's Manhattan and it's a weekend service. Who knows? And I said, great, that's their problem. I'm going back to sleep, man. I got another hour of sleep here. So I want everyone, you don't have to believe me. You don't have to believe what someone else does. All you need to do is run the numbers. That is my only suggestion to you. Go to a buy versus rent calculator. Make sure you plug in all the fees, not just the taxes, the realtor fee. Uh, if you get a bigger place, you're probably gonna get more furniture for it. Whether it's a house or investments, my point to you guys is take your money seriously. <clears throat> Once you take your money seriously and you put some time in it, whether it's this book or wherever you wanna get your information, you're gonna be better off for it. You don't wanna delegate this to somebody else. Mm. I want you to understand it. And once you understand it and you automate it, you make a few good choices in life, you never have to worry about lattes or appetite. Well, once you, when you buy a steak and you eat it, do you feel like you just threw your money away on that steak? Where is it? I don't see it. Where's my investment? Yeah. You get value out mm. of a steak just like you get value out of renting. Now, if you want to incidentally build equity, that's great. But remember, right. you can also lose equity. Right now in Manhattan, do you know rents are down? Is and it? Yes, and so are prices of houses if you wanna buy. They're going down every month. Wow. A lot of people are like, oh my God, it's so expensive. Sometimes, but sometimes it goes down 5%, 10%. Some of these neighborhoods are down 15%. No way. Yeah, so a lot of people don't realize. In fact, I did a survey of my readers. I said, do you think it's possible for real estate to decrease. Over half of people said no. They had never even thought about it. So I want Remember people- Remember 2008, 2009? Memories are short. I heard right. people, dude, they had three houses. They bought it, they were destroyed financially. They had, their credit was ruined. They had to give up these houses and their identity as an investor. And three years later, they're like, I think I wanna buy another couple of houses. Wow. It just goes to show, I'm not saying they're stupid. It's not that at all because a lot of people have gone through this. It's the idea that the propaganda to buy a house mm. or to follow a prescribed set of rules for the American dream is so powerful that even losing your own houses doesn't change people's perspective. I'll give you an example. Like I call it the handshake effect. And it's when people would come over uh, to my apartment and for the first time and they would say, wow, this is an amazing view. And then they always say the same thing in New York. Do you own this place? And I say, no, I rent. And it's that moment where if I had said I bought, they would be like this. Wow. Yeah, that's pretty really impressive. Cool, really cool. Yeah. And you kind of get this, this pride. This pride. Thing, yeah. And then I and then when I don't say that, they get really confused. Cause this is the I will teach you to be rich guy. But also he rents, and I thought renting is for people who can't afford it, but I, you know, they don't understand. And they give me this look, and I realized that. So many of us are looking for somebody to approve of us while we are shaking their hand, mm. someone we don't even know. Wow. And so instead of getting your approval from somebody you just met 10 minutes ago, or from your parents who probably are not the most sophisticated investors, if you're watching this show, you know, you talk about greatness. And being great means choosing your own path. Sometimes you might choose to buy. I have no problem with that if you ran the numbers and you consciously decided. Sometimes it means you don't. But if you wanna live the life of greatness, you need to be comfortable making different choices than what other people expect.